Hi, I'm Mark Jewell, co-founder of the Efficiency Sales Professional Institute in downtown San Francisco. Today we're going to be talking about taking control of your energy use. Now, I guess the first section of this presentation is very, very important because you have to first compare what is to what could be in order to set the stage for taking control of your energy use. The first observation that I'd like to put on the table is that energy is not a fixed cost. And you say, well, why would you ever say that? Of course it's not a fixed cost. Interestingly enough, many years ago, there was an interview done for a variety of CFOs across the country, and fully 45% of the CFOs interviewed said that they thought that energy was a fixed cost. Now, of course, when the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency got word of this, they said, holy cow, then we got to do some lobbying with the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, because apparently the way they're advancing their formatted financial statements to their brethren, energy is actually in the portion of the financial statement that you'd expect to see fixed costs. Alas, the lobbying was not successful. So an unseasoned CPA might actually think that energy is a fixed cost because of where it sh shows up in the financial statement. I can t I'm here to tell you, though, with authority that energy is not a fixed cost. I've been plying these waters uh, of energy efficiency since, well, in 1993, so it's uh, you know, over two decades now. And I can tell you that I've seen some remarkable improvements made in organizations when they finally get a wind of the fact that there is a lot of control that they have over their energy fate, future, and there are things that they can do to improve their fate. Okay? So the first question I'd like to ask you is, are you asking the right questions? <laughs> Let's talk about some of these questions. What's the payback? Everybody asks what the payback is, okay? It's silly, it's crazy talk. Why would you be so fixated on how fast you're gonna get your money back when ultimately you're making an investment? I mean, would you, if you call your stockbroker at uh, you know, Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab or one of these other companies, do you ask them how fast will I get the money back if I buy the stock? No, it's an investment. Just as improvements in energy efficiency, capital improvements in energy efficiency are genuine investments. Okay, so. Is simple pay period even the right metric to be using? I would contend it isn't. And we'll talk about some alternative metrics later on in this show. The second question that a lot of people ask is, how many kilowatts, kilowatt hours, or therms would the project save? Well, let me ask you something. How many decision makers in your organization think in therms? How many of, them, how many, how many of them even know what a therm is? And even if they know the technical definition of a therm as 100,000 BTUs, then they have to realize what a BTU is and what relevance a BTU has to their annual energy consumption. Suffice to say, I don't think that most decision makers are thinking in KW, KWH, or therms. A lot of people say, well, let's insulate those pipes. Are we insulating them to save therms, or are we insulating them to improve plant safety and comfort? <clears throat> On a similar note, when you put modular boilers in, are we doing that to save therms, or are we doing that to improve startup time, reduce downtime, and provide the operation with valuable redundancy? Now, on a very personal note, a very, you know, very um, how should I say, accessible level, let's talk about a typical commercial kitchen. Also uses gas, okay, for heating, cooking. And now you ask yourself, when someone decides to buy a turbo pot to put in that kitchen, are they doing it to save therms? Now, what is a turbo pot, you might ask? Good question. A turbo pot is a very ingeniously devised piece of cooking equipment that is like any other pot, except on the bottom, it's extra thick, and in the, into that bottom are milled fins to increase the ability, I should say technically, to increase the surface area that the flame can contact, increasing the speed with which f um, heat enters the pot. Statistically, it's been proven that a turbo pot can boil water 40% faster not an insubstantial advantage when you're trying to steam dumplings or vegetables or make pasta in a restaurant setting. So it shouldn't surprise you that a national restaurant chain recently standardized on turbo pots. Did they do it because they wanted to save therms? Actually, probably not. In fact, in many commercial kitchens I've been uh, privileged to visit, they leave the gas burners on to save time lighting the burners as they're firing the entrees. So they're not saving gas. They're doing it because they want to quicken the pace at which they can heat things up and they could do more lunch or dinner covers during a typical shift. So it's always important to reframe the question that you're asking and make it relevant to the segment that you happen to be operating in. Another question I hear a lot is, how much could we save on our utility bills? But at, at the same time, does the promise of utility cost savings motivate your capital budgeting folks? I mean, for many of them, in most businesses, let's say a typical fire, financial insurance, real estate operation where it's paper pushing that they do, as opposed to, say, Alcoa, where they spend a tremendous amount of energy smelting and molding aluminum, 
most of these garden variety businesses, you know, tax preparers and lawyers and accountants and hair dryer, hairdressers and things like that, I mean, these folks don't use a lot of energy in relation to the payroll that they have in the facility. So if you ask yourself how much can we save on our utility bills, the number may actually be fairly small in, re in juxtaposition to the rest of the line items on your profit and loss statement. So what value do you emphasize when proposing efficiency projects? And by the way, this course is really designed for owners and occupants of organizations trying to take control of their own energy use. But it is well advised for service providers and vendors who serve those occupants to also look at this course because whether you're the owner, the internal champion trying to sell the owner, or you're the external champion trying to bring a, a valuable energy service or product, energy saving service or product to the, to the fore, it's important to understand what does that ultimate decision maker value and how does what you're providing map into those values, okay? So, Admittedly, there are organizations out there that want to save energy for whatever reason. Maybe an ideological belief that the, the, you know, you've got global warming, we've got to save energy. It could be a, um, uh, a very cost efficient uh, thing. I mean, people may say, I'm going to save energy because I want to save money. Okay? Not, this doesn't float everyone's boats. I mean, classically, Americans are not known as a nation of savers. I mean, credit card debt is three times what it was in 1994. It's just one example. And in fact, even saving energy. A lot of people, for a lot of people, saving energy may be sort of an intangible that they can't really quite get their arms around. Now, when you're advocating for a project inside your organization, should you focus on the money? Okay, you might want to focus on the money because you think, well, money talks and, you know, we're going to ask for money to do the improvement, so let's focus on how much we're going to save. Okay, that might work in some settings. But let's talk about what you're going to quantify and monetize and what you're going to put into that basket when you bring it in tied up with a bow and ask the capital budgeting officer to write a check for something that you're proposing. I find, and again, I've touched three billion square feet of North American real estate in the last 20 years in this business. And when I studiously look at what causes people to say yes and no to energy efficiency projects and services, I often see that most people are incompletely viewing the basket of benefits. They limit their intentions to utility cost financial benefits. That would be rebates, incentives, and of course, a reduction in the monthly utility bill. But they don't really give enough attention to bucket number two, the non-utility cost financial benefits. And we'll give you plenty of examples of that in just a minute. And finally, the non-financial benefits, things like getting an Energy Star label, things like getting a LEED certification, these are important as well. And I'll tell you something, I've witnessed organizations jumping through hoops to get these stickers, the Energy Star label, the LEED certification, doing the expending dollars and man hours that they would never have expended if the only promise of rainbow at the end, the, the only promise of the gold at the end of the rainbow was a lower utility bill. They're doing it, quite frankly, out of pride out of avoidance of embarrassment, out of competitive uh, nature because they want to uh, you know, ex excel in their uh, uh, business milieu. They want to impress their customers, their tenants, their employees, their investors, whatever. So the non-financial benefits can be very, very significant even if they don't ever hit the bottom line. Now I'm here to tell you also that in many cases the non-financial benefits do leak back into the second bucket. And one example is, of course, the value of an Energy Star label in a commercial office building that is rented for income. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. So could these other financial benefits far outweigh the utility cost savings? I'm here to tell you that they can. Uh, as one example, and I use this example from our Learning to See, Sell Efficiency Effectively curriculum, um, it's very obvious that if you juxtapose the value of the real estate, uh, energy efficiency, you know, I should say the value of the utility bill per square foot of real estate, versus the value of the payroll that is being operated on that square footage real estate, you'll find that the payroll is about 200 to, I'm sorry, 100 times larger than the energy bill. In this example, you've got a $40,000 salary and benefits being divided about by 200 square feet per person, giving you about $200 a square foot in payroll. And if you take a look at $2 a square foot, which is around the national average for energy uh, costs, of course, in places like Hawaii, it's a lot larger than that because the unit cost of uh, kilowatt hours is a lot higher. But in, in certain other places like New York City and, and Los Angeles and other places, you'll have hot spots of utility rates especially in critical peak pricing, automated demand response environments. But bottom line, getting back to the national average, you're talking about $2 a square foot, which is roughly one hundredth of the amount of money you're spending for payroll per square foot in your operation. So I get to the bottom line here, this last bullet, what if your efficiency campaign boosted productivity by even just a 1%? 
So you ask yourself, what does that mean? Well, I don't know, 10 hour day, which is a long day for most professionals, times 60 minutes a day, an hour, which means no bathroom breaks, no coffee breaks, no lunch, that's 600 minutes a day. Improving that person's productivity by 1% means making that person more productive for six minutes a day. That's two turns of a Williams-Sonoma soft-boiled egg timer, one of those little hourglass sand thingies, tells you when your soft-boiled eggs are ready. Two turns of a little hourglass sand timer, a three-minute sand timer for soft-boiled eggs. Okay, so do you think that things that you're going to be doing to take control of energy use in your environment will also have the concomitant benefit of making people more thermally comfortable in the environment, therefore less, uh, less um, um, likely to complain about their environment? to the coworkers, which wastes a lot of time, not only their time, but also their coworkers' time. Uh, maybe you're gonna get rid of some glare. Maybe you're gonna give them more light so they can actually see what they're doing. I remember a story of a metal manufacturing shop making aluminum doors and windows, and they improved the lighting of the shop. It was a 4.2 year payback, but when they realized that the better lighting quality allowed people to see what they were cutting, screwing, and, dr screwing and drilling, they actually wound up having 25% less scrap, and that reduce the payback of the investment from 4.2 years to 39 days. Now in that case, you had two distinct non-utility cost financial benefits. One is making people more productive, and two is reducing aluminum scrap, okay? Um, so let's go back to uh, uh, some documentation we can see in the marketplace that can underscore this point and really uh, make you understand that we're not talking about one and two percent benefits here. Statistics show major companies, Lockheed, West Bend Mutual Insurance, ING Bank, Verifone, these are big increases in productivity, Sig substantial, noticeable increase, uh, decreases in absenteeism, okay? And this is, by the way, from the Department of Energy and the Rocky Mountain Institute. Now, this is a funny story you'll probably be telling your spouse about this evening. Um, you know, can you reduce the payback of an LED lighting retrofit of a milking parlor, going from fluorescence to LED lamps, from four years to three months, if you remember to include the increased milk production that the cows give you because apparently cows like LEDs more than fluorescent. <laughs> Who knew, right? Bottom line is it's a very real phenomenon that's been witnessed not only in Texas where this original study was done, but also in places like California and beyond. So just be careful when you're talking about what benefits you're going to value and what the payback is, et cetera, how you're going to attract attention in your organization to give you the money that you want to do, that you need to do the project that you'd like to do. Just remember, don't limit yourself to how much the utility bill is going to be reduced each month. Uh, by the way, if you happen to have a data center centric operation, every minute you have in downtime in that data center, at least national average, $5,600 in real cost to the organization. If you're a surgical environment, like a hospital has a surgical theater, if you, how much, just think about it for a moment, how much revenue would you lose if you could no longer positively pressurize that surgical suite? Think about it. I mean, every C-section is $22,000 or thereabouts. Let's say you do five or 10 of them a day. Let's say you do one open heart surgery and maybe a hip replacement. It's not unusual to have a little surgical theater do a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars worth of revenue a day. What happens if you have a past rated life fan system that's about to fail and you have the opportunity to replace that with let's say a fan array system which would give you pretty much absolute redundancy to make sure that from now until the end of life of that rated fan system, the rated life of the fan system, you would have redundant airflow to that surgical suite and not have to worry about losing revenue in that surgical suite because of some uh, malady of the air conditioning system. Switching now to schools, not every state does it this way, but as we talked about in the Learning to See program, Sell Efficiency Effectively, it really helps to recalibrate energy savings into human comfort and into the driver of value that that human comfort provides. So for example, in schools, uh, very common to have school districts be subsidized by the state based on average daily attendance. If you increase the energy efficiency of the school, studies have shown that more teachers show up, which decreases your substitute teacher budget. Uh, more students show up, which not only improves learning outcomes, but also and make sure there are more juvenile butts and seats, which gives you a bigger check from the state at the end of the year. Um, ice cream sales. <laughs> you know, I read a study in Britain not so long ago that 19% higher frozen food and uh, these. Uh, let me correct myself. 19% higher sales were witnessed after installing LED lights in mid and low temperature region cases in a supermarket environment. That's paraphrasing a pretty accurate statistical study. Bottom line is, do you think they made more money on saving electricity? or maybe replacing lamps less frequently, or selling 19% more Ben & Jerry's ice cream at six bucks a pint? I think the answer is obvious. So how significant are these utility cost financial benefits for income producing properties? I alluded to this before. 
I haven't, I, I've been in the real estate business since 1984. Uh, I was in commercial real estate in Los Angeles with a two million square foot portfolio with partners. And then of course, it, since then, we've been working with commercial real estate uh, with, in a variety of settings. But bottom line is, if you take a look at what the mother's milk of real estate investors are, is, you'll find that it's net operating income. And energy is a huge cost in, on the income statement of an income producing property owner or manager. And the, because it's a huge cost, whatever savings you can get on the landlord's income statement to produce higher net operating income, there's a wonderful multiplier effect that goes in, into, into effect and it actually drives higher appraised value. This is the formula. It's one of two approaches to the income approach to appraisal that's used to value income property in the marketplace. And you can see that net operating income is in the numerator. A thing called capitalization rate is in the denominator. We'll talk about this in the financial analysis advanced class and also in the uh, intermediate class. But bottom line is if you have higher rent uh, as a result of greater tenant comfort and convenience and, or lower utility bills that allow you to charge more rent for your space, if you have lower vacancy because you've uh, had better tenant attraction or retention, if the landlord's share of operating expenses is reduced because they have the common areas or any other loads that the landlord is responsible for, reduced in energy costs because of the efficiency maneuvers that you're doing, all those things inure to the betterment of net operating income. And if you divide it by a stable capitalization rate, in other words, one that is unchanging before and after the retrofit, you wind up with a higher asset value, at least using this direct capitalization approach to the income approach to appraisal. A lot of, a lot of appraisers use this, uh, if nothing else, to triangulate their appraised value of the building. So whether you're in schools or in offices or income property or cow bar barns, milking barns or data centers or whatever, any of the examples I just gave you, it's very clear that by taking of your energy use, you're going to have downstream impacts that are very positive on your organization. And in most cases, the impacts that are non-utility cost financial impacts are going to be superior to the impacts that are on the utility bill. Okay? So you need to reframe efficiency so that it can be measured with the yardsticks you're already using to track your success. If you're a dairy parlor operator, a milking parlor, parlor operator, that means that you're going to look at how much milk is produced after you put this new efficient lighting in. Um, and if you have the same luck that the folks in California and Texas have had replacing the lighting from fluorescent LED, you're going to wind up having more milk, and that's exactly one of the things you've been, you've been uh, tracking as a KPI, key performance indicator in your dairy business. So what could be even more important than saving energy or even money? It turns out that, hey, look, there are a lot of organizations out there, yours might be one of them, where reducing carbon emissions is really high on the executive agenda. And of course, energy efficiency improvements does do that. Improving occupant comfort. You know, I, I was uh, reminded the other day that BOMA, the Building Owners and Managers Association, which has 9 billion square feet, that's billion with a B, 9 billion square feet of members in North America and beyond, they do a, a tenant satisfaction survey once a year with a group I think called Kingsley. And for as long as I can remember, that tenant Kingsley, the Kingsley Tenant Satisfaction Survey done in coordination with BOMA has found too hot, too cold to be the number one or number two largest complaints, most frequently seen complaints in their tenant satisfaction surveys. Enough said. Avoiding budget cuts. Maybe you're in an admissible environment and you're trying to maintain police and fire protection, maybe not make, make sure you have enough teachers, and so you, you're wisely reducing your, your uh, overhead in uh, operating expenses to make sure you have more money left over for those salaries. Uh, how about improved safety? Maybe the control systems that you put in place are allowing you to have better control of the airstream. You're testing for volatile organic compounds, CO, carbon monoxide, CO2, carbon dioxide. These all have concomitant benefits of improving the safety of the environment. In addition to allowing you to know how much fresh air has to be introduced in that environment, which of course is why you'd put some of those sensors together. Um, ensuring regulatory compliance, closer related to concept, emulating best practice facilities. You may be in an organization that admiringly glances at a competitor who's already done a lot to lower their operating expense structure, their cost structure, and, and, and or has uh, gotten a lot of green press releases on you know, lauding them, congratulating them for what they've done to help the environment and become a good corporate citizen. So emulating back best practice facilities might just be the acupressure point to get the thing done in your organization. Um, avoiding obsolescence. You, know, you may be surprised to look at these diskettes uh, and think, well, wait a second, we've had an energy management system in this building for 15 years. 15 years ago, that software was probably put into your building using one of these disks. Wow. Now, if you give a high school kid or college kid or grammar school kid one of these, they'll think you bought them a sexy drink coaster at, at Crate and Barrel. 
uh, and they'll say, well, Dad, this is a kind of a fun drink coaster, but it leaks. Well, son, it's actually not a drink coaster. It was what we used to put software on before you were in short pants. <laughs> Upgrading to a better user interface. Uh, you know, it's no secret that engineers across the planet are frustrated with how they have to control their buildings through the change of ownership and change in, in uh, mechanical staffs and other changes that happen. Many people have lost the manuals, these control systems, a long time ago, or they've just never really been schooled properly in how to control their operating systems. So to the extent that you can bring in new uh, visibility and control, that actually might be a driver to get everybody's approval soft circled around your organization to upgrade to a better system. Not only will you save energy, but you'll give the mechanical staff, the, the, uh, the uh, building operations staff, more visibility, uh, more preemptive power, they'll be able to see when things are about to break because they've got data streams coming in for whatever you're installing to save energy. And, you know, it's a really good thing. Saving a project manager's job. I heard a funny story the other day. A municipality uh, here in California decided to go forward with energy management programs because they had a project manager that they didn't have anything for him to do. And they knew that if they didn't undertake some fairly um, you know, uh, bold and audacious initiative, they'd have to lay him off, which would put him and his family you know, on the bread lines. And so bottom line is that may be an indicator. You may have underutilized staff in your organization who are looking for something you can really sink their teeth into and create value for the, op for, for the organization. Of course, I talked about this before, earning the Energy Star lead certification. Only you know how important one or both of these designations is in your marketplace. But it may just be the acupressure point to get senior management behind an energy saving maneuver. Um, and avoid, avoiding an embarrassing energy performance score is interesting. If you go to a website called buildingrating.org, buildingrating.org, it's actually run uh, by uh, the Institute of Market Transformation. It's been around for a couple of decades, run by a friend of mine, Cliff Majerzyk. Um, you'll find they have maps of which jurisdictions in the country have mandated the disclosure of energy performance. Big cities, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Washington, D.C., Chicago, San Francisco, where we happen to be located. Um, lots of these cities are mandating that if you have a certain type of building over a certain size, you have to report to the city or th this county, in some cases the state, what your energy usage is. And I'll tell you something, on a scale of 1 to 100 with this Energy Star Portfolio Manager software, which I, to my knowledge, every one of these uh, uh, jurisdictions is using the Portfolio Manager as the uh, benchmark to be using. You know, if you get a 17 on a scale of 1 to 100, knowing that 1 is not valedictorian, that's not a good thing. And so avoiding an embarrassing energy performance score might actually tip over management into your side of the, of the, of the, the off the fence into your side of the yard. Uh, if you say, listen, we have to do this because soon we're going to have to be dis disclosing our energy performance to some party out there and we don't want to have a bad score. It's going to reflect poorly on, on the organization. Now, what if you're a tenant? you want to take control of your energy use, but maybe you've not necessarily secured the approval or the interest level even of your landlord. Well, the first thing I would recommend is that you need to know how the costs and benefits of improving energy efficiency would be split between you and your landlord. Armed with that information, you can then make a plan, okay? For example, if you're in a triple net lease building where you pay all operating expenses, including energy, your landlord's not going to be so motivated to pay for energy efficiency improvements to your space because you're going to be the sole beneficiary of those improvements. Except if you have language in your lease that says that the landlord can invest in expense reducing capital projects in your space in the middle of existing leases and allow you to benefit from the energy savings and then allow the landlord to claw back some of those energy savings to amortize his investment in your space in many cases with interest for having done so. And so you can make a very, really, really strong case if you actually have that language in your lease or you volunteer to add that language in your lease for a landlord to invest dollars that maybe you don't have to improve the energy efficiency of your space. And maybe you'll give that person a payback over say five years as investment. And in the meantime, you might even throw in 6% interest, which is probably 24 times what he's getting in the money market on non-deployed capital right now. Very, very sexy concept to bring up with your landlord if they're looking for ways to grow the net operating income and improve the capital structure of the building. Um, boy, if you offer to use dollars that you're now wasting, spending them on utility and utilities that you, know, you could really reduce your utility bill, are you willing to give that income stream to the, or that expense stream for you, to the landlord so it becomes part of his income stream? That's an interesting conversation. I think uh, every landlord in the country would be interested in, in talking with you about that. So how do you tell which facilities most deserve capital or attention. 
capital meaning you know nobody has an infinite uh, budget for improvements and management attention. There's you know you you got to fight for slices of finite management bandwidth. So in your organization, let's say you have a multi-facility organization, how do you tell which facilities most deserve capital attention? You know, over the years, and again, I've had the privilege of dealing with literally hundreds of organizations and talking to C-level executives about how they do their prioritization, I've heard lots of different uh, ways to do this. Um, some people use kilowatts. How many, you know, how much, what's our demand per square foot? Uh, some people use a kilowatt hours. Uh, how many kilowatt hours is this particular building using? Some people use cost, energy cost. Lots of different metrics. And by the way, if you use any one of those single metrics to try to figure out which buildings are most deserving of your management bandwidth and capital, you're, you're probably sadly mistaken, unless you're, you happen to be lucky. This, the, the Energy Star Portfolio Manager, is your answer to that problem. Because this is a software tool that the taxpayers have funded, you as a taxpayer have partially funded this, and uh, have participated in funding this. And since 1998 or so, this tool has been available for citizens who are interested in getting a handle on what energy performance they actually have. Um, what's nice about it is it normalizes for a lot of things that you wouldn't think of normalizing for. Not only weather, perhaps one of the most obvious, but also building size, number of people, number of personal computers, operating hours, space type. I mean, data centers obviously use more energy than garden variety office space. And the fact that this tool can take all that into account, now you might find that a building that had outsized electric utility bills every month was not, in fact, inefficient. It just had a lot of data center space, okay? So the reason that this tool was invented was that, it, that the EPA and the DOE wanted to give American citizens a way to compare efficient and inefficient products, in this case, buildings. Now, when they started the Energy Performance Benchmarking Tool, they were you know, drafting on the success, the brand equity of the Energy Star label, which had already been assigned to hundreds, if not thousands of products, so that customers who were thinking about buying those products, consumers, could determine which peer products were more efficient than others, okay? I say, well, you know, if there's a complicated, if there's ever a complicated product that you'd have to be very skilled to, to, to determine its relative efficiency, it's a building. And so what they're trying to do is give a sort of miles per gallon rating for a building with all the complicated things, statistically significant things, normalized out, so you can really tell whether or not one building is more efficient than another. That's what the Energy Star tool is all about. Now, this is the commercial buildings program of which the portfolio manager is a piece. And, you know, I don't need to read all these words to you. The fact of the matter is it's something that the government put into place, calling upon the strong brand recognition, the positive association that people already had with the Energy Star label, and they wanted to put it on buildings to clearly telegraph to the marketplace that this building has superior energy performance when normalized against all these other factors, okay? Now, you can't get an Energy Star label, that blue sticker that you saw a picture of, unless you benchmark. And you benchmark, and then if the building proves to be rateable, we'll get into that in a minute, and it scores on a 75 or higher, 75th percentile or higher, meaning it's in the top 25% most efficient buildings of its kind after having been normalized for all the factors, then you get the sticker and you can brag about that all the way to the bank. Now, it's also a management tool because it assesses whole building energy and water consumption and it allows you to track changes in that consumption so that you can take the appropriate action. Okay? You can share data, you can produce reports, you can even create custom reports, and of course, as I mentioned before, if you have a Energy Star label qualified building, you can actually get the award. It's a metrics calculator, and boy, if you've ever tried to do any of these metrics in, by hand, you'll know how difficult they are. The Energy Star Buildings Program allows you to automatically calculate source and site energy. What does that mean? Well, source energy is how much energy is required at the power plant to produce the site energy that you see at your wall outlet when you plug something in. So when you look at your electric bill, you're talking about site energy. When you're really looking at climate change and the, the greenhouse gas emissions caused by generation, distribution, transmission, then you're look, looking at source energy. Not surprisingly, Energy Star rates your building on source energy because that's what causes the pollution and that's why EPA and DOE are even in this game in the first place, helping Americans have a better understanding of how much energy they're using with the hope that they can reduce the unnecessary combustion of fossil fuels by stopping waste, the waste of electricity and, uh, and other fuel sources in their environment. Okay, um, what's interesting about this Energy Star uh, tool is that it's absolutely been proven to be effective at driving better decisions and also it, you know, rewarding people for having a vigilant eye over multiple fiscal years on what their energy consumption actually is. These two graphs 
uh, come from a 30,000 building study that EPA put together not so long ago that talks about how buildings that who had, who had benchmarked themselves over these, these periods of time enjoyed on average a 7% savings in their energy use and a six point increase in their ENERGY STAR score. So this is really further proof that you can't manage what you don't measure. And if you do measure it and you're conscious about managing it in the wake of that measurement, you're golden, okay? Uh, this is a great chart. It comes from the Institute of Market Transformation, IMT.org. It talks about no less than six studies that have been done in roughly the last half dozen years that show absolutely statistically significant positive correlations between having an ENERGY STAR label on an income producing property and having higher rental rates, higher sales price, and lower vacancy. Here it's termed as uh, occupancy premium. So what more evidence do you need? If you're in the income property business, you're obviously there to make as much net operating income and asset value as you can. You take a look at these statistics, Energy Star label office buildings uh, having these attributes of higher rental rates, uh, higher sales prices, and lower vacancy, clearly something you need to start paying attention to as you're considering taking control of your energy use. So let's go through quickly which buildings can be benchmarked. Uh, I'm here to report that happily, any building can be benchmarked. If you ask a different question though, which buildings can enjoy the ENERGY STAR rating of 1 to 100, or which buildings can receive a rating of 75 or higher and actually get a label, then that's a smaller subset of buildings. It's less than 20 types. Um, for those who cannot have enough data from EPA DOE to be able to have the tool give them a 1 to 100 score, there are still about 60 more property types for which the government has enough data to at least give you a weather normalized national average expressed as 1,000 British thermal units per square foot per year. So the KBTU, the 1,000 British thermal units, is a metric that the government settled on to be the universal metric into which all other energy users are converted. So kilowatt hours of electricity, gallons of diesel, et cetera, et cetera, even gallons of chilled water, everything gets converted into KBTU, which makes it easier for people to think about in the engineering world. Now, if you're not amongst the roughly 20 spaces that are rateable, and you're not amongst the 60 spaces that, for which you can get a weather normalized national average, hope, all hope is not lost. You can still get your own weather normalized KB2 per square foot, against, which you can use to measure yourself against yourself over time. Okay? So, it's, and somebody says at a cocktail party, how many buildings can be benchmarked using this Energy Star Portfolio Manager thing? Uh, the answer is any building can be benchmarked. If they said how many buildings could get a, a rating of 1 to 100, then that would be a lesser subset of that. It would probably 20, 20 or less building types. There are about 17 now. Uh, actually, no, there are 20 now, three of which you can, actually can't get the Energy Star label on, although you can get the 1 to 100 rating, and a new space type that's uh, on the horizon for multifamily. So bottom line is about 20. About 60 more you can get a weather normalized national average for, but not the 1 to 100 score. And the rest of the buildings in the universe, you can at least get your weather normalized KB2 per square foot. It's called energy use intensity. So this is uh, a quick run through of the buildings for which you can get a 1 to 100 score. And if you do meet all the other eligibility requirements, you could also qualify for the label. And of course, that's assuming that the score turns out to be 75 or higher. Office buildings, data centers, banking and financial, a courthouse, medical office, hospital, that now just certain kinds of hospitals, this is a general medical and surgical hospital, retail stores, and in a separate category are supermarkets and groceries because they have such intense refrigeration as you might imagine, they couldn't be fairly gauged against say dry goods retailers like JCPenney or Sears. Hotels, uh, dormitories, houses of worship, churches, synagogues, mosques, etc., warehouse both non-refrigerated and refrigerated, um, K through 12 schools, wastewater treatment plants, senior care. Now you can also get them for distribution centers. You could also get it for the new multifamily housing type that's coming out. But bottom line is a, a good handful of, you know, about 20 space types for which you could get a one to 100 score. Um, the dormitory, military barracks, and uh, medical office space types. In fact, I don't think I had a slide in this, uh, in this uh, run of slides for military barracks, but it's another space type for which you can get a 1 to 100 score. Those three space types, dormitory, military barracks, and, and uh, medical office, uh, going into uh, the, the January 1st, 2014, EPA changed the rules a bit and said you can still get a 1 to 100 rating, but you can't get an energy star label even if you do get a 75 or higher. Why? Because they didn't feel as if the data points that, they, that were underpinning that 1 to 100 score um, uh, rating system were up to date enough. 
So when they update those, I, I have it on good authority from Washington, D.C., when they update those data points uh, to a newer database, chances are those three space types will come back into the four and not only be able to get a water water rating, but also be able to get a label. Okay, so if you're ever interested in what kinds of property types are out there that can be benchmarked, either rateable or at least the uh, weather normalized national average, EPA has this document that you can find online called Property Types, Definitions, and Use Details. What's nice about this in the last column, it tells you the data points that you have to get in order to get a benchmark score of some sort or at least a weather normalized national average uh, or, you know, uh, the KB2 numbers, okay? These, these are the ingredients for cooking this recipe. Uh, and this is available online at the Energy Star Portfolio Manager website. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the most impressive aspects of this um, tool is the ability to set baselines and savings targets. This is a very wordy slide, but I'll, I'll read it to you. <laughs> An energy baseline period must be a 12-month period for which the property has energy data for all meters and fuel types. An energy baseline can be established by selecting a specific period, ending month and year, or by allowing portfolio manager to automatically determine the period. When automatically determining an energy baseline period, portfolio manager will start with the year 2000 and determine the earliest date for which the building uh, this is uh, this, uh, for which the building has complete energy data. The energy baseline period is the baseline uh, period used to be, to be used for tracking all energy emissions and performance rating changes. Specific energy performance targets may also be set, and this functionality may be used in conjunction with entering f uh, facility improvements to increase energy efficiency to properly reflect a facility's energy performance history. So bottom line is this is a quote out of the EPA website. Uh, what, what does it say? It says that if you don't do anything, the Energy Star tool is going to assume a baseline period of the oldest 12 months of data you have, uh, for, you know, the oldest 12 months for which you have complete uh, data in your tool for your building. But at any time, you can set a different baseline. And it also alluded to the fact that setting targets is also both possible and important. So going to that topic, let me talk about how to set a target. Because when you're talking about taking control of your energy use, you have to be talking about targets. You, you can't manage what you don't measure. And once you measure it, in order to manage it, you've got to set some goals. You've got to track your performance toward those goals. So in this particular situation, you see a building. This, by the way, is out of the new Portfolio Manager tool that was introduced July 17, 2013. Um, you see I have three buildings here. Um, and if you uh, go to the Action column, which is the last column on this, on this table, I want to. Uh, the choices are View Property Goals and Improvements, Add or Edit Baselines or Targets, Add Performance Improvements, Open Sustainability Checklist. Um, so these are all actions that are available to you. So let's imagine that you wanted to set a baseline or a target. What do you do? Well, you go to the building that's in question. In this case, it's the demo office building abridged. You click the goals tab at the property level. This is a, the property level series of tabs. And then you, you, so you click this, um, you select the set baselines or targets button that you see here in the lower right hand corner of your screen. Uh, when you do that, you'll notice that the baseline is already defaulted in this particular building for 12-31-2011. Why? Because that is no doubt the earliest period of time for which Energy Star Portfolio Manager knew that you had complete data um, you know, since the year 2000. So you can see here the radio button, Let Portfolio Manager Automatically Set My Baselines, is selected. At the bottom half of the screen, you'll see where you notice where the, you know, what the target is for the building. You have the opportunity to, to change the target. In this case, there's no target, okay? But you could just as easily take a look at where you are, at least in, in view of the uh, median property, which is the 50th percentile type of property, national average. Um, you see that your score here is a 76. Your baseline score on a scale of 1 to 100 is 61. But your current score, the most recent 12 months when this slide was produced, was a 76. And so what does that mean? That means the median property is a 50, not surprisingly, 50th percentile. And you can see the next line, source energy use intensity. The following line, site energy use intensity. This is in KBTU per square foot per year. You can see here that the baseline was 199. The current is 161. The national average is 223. So it's not surprising you have a score that's better than 50 because you're actually using less energy than a typical building at the, you know, the, the median, the average building, okay? But let's say we wanted to set a target. Let's say we wanted to set a target and we wanted it to be 30% better than, my ba than, than your baseline, okay? So here you, you, you select the target percentage better than baseline from the, the drop-down menu and you type 30% in for the target. And then you simply save and calculate the other metrics by clicking that blue button there. 
You'll notice immediately after you click that blue button, save and calculate other metrics, that the column that is pre presently populated with a series of not available notifications, that uh, fourth column there from the left in the target column, as soon as you do that, it's going to be populated with real numbers. And you'll see that in order to be 30% better than the baseline, you have to get yourself to a score of 86. Uh, and then you have to, of course, reduce your um, uh, site energy usage from 52 to 45, roughly, uh, kb2 per square foot per year. What I like about this specificity is that much in the uh, spirit of the Jerry Lewis telethon, where you're coloring in a thermometer to get to a certain level of contributions during a certain radio or television hour, uh, in this case, you, can, uh, you know that the delta between where you were, which is about 28 million kb2 per, per year, uh, to where you need to be to get that score of 85, uh, 24.4 million kb2 per year. Now you have a number of kb2 per year, about 4 million kb2 per year, that you have to reduce. Okay, And now it's only a matter of getting potential projects, converting their p projected energy savings into kb2, and you're golden. Okay, so you, you know, much as you might you know, color in that thermometer for the Jerry Lewis telethon about how many projects have I gotten to raise these, in, in this case, how many donations have I gotten to meet this goal. In this case, it's how many projects have I, have I put on the boards and approved with capital budgeting so that at the end of the year, when I do my math, I'm going to find out that I had 4 million, roughly 4 million KB2 per, per year saved. It's a great tool if you're interested in taking control of your energy use. So one piece of advice I'll give you, and I think it'll be very, very helpful, is you have to track and share your successes. And be sure to let capital budgeting know how smart they were to give you the money. I speak all over the country. I speak more than 100 times a year. And in many audiences, when I'm on this topic, I ask, show of hands, how many people write a thank you note to capital budgeting for the money that they gave you to do a particular project? And ideally, a thank you note that says, thanks for the capital. I just, I'm happy to report that we're actually above projections in terms of savings. Uh, in other words, we've exceeded the projections that we gave you when we asked you for the money. And thank you again for giving us the capital for what has turned out to be even a better than expected project. If you do that, what do you think is going to happen in the mind of the person who's a capital budgeting expert? They can say, well, first of all, this is the only person that's ever very thankful for the capital I've given them. Everybody else is ungrateful in this organization. <laughs> And secondly, what's going to happen the next time you give them another proposal? They're going to clear their desk. They're going to look at your proposal because they know, A, you have respect for the dollar, B, you have the common courtesy to thank them for the dollars that they sent your way, and C, you're tracking the results, and D, you're willing to share the results. So it makes everybody feel good all the way around, and it's definitely a good practice to get into.